Hello and welcome to another episode of Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. The Big Blue. Our oceans are home to some of nature's most gorgeous, unique, and wild species. From the vast open ocean to thriving metropolitan coral reefs, our watery neighbors are as beautiful as they are diverse. However, just as we're starting to understand the depths of our own planet, we're also realizing that we're destroying it as quickly as new discoveries are made. We read headline after headline alerting us to rising sea temperatures, acidification of our oceans, and coral bleaching event after event. Considering the scale of these problems, it's easy to feel hopeless and disconnected from the truth. So, what's really going on with coral reefs? Why are these bleaching events happening? What are scientists doing to help corals combat climate change? And is there any way we can help, no matter where we are? To teach us everything corals, today we're sitting down with Annie Lamb, an Australian coral researcher, genetics expert, and very soon to be PhD. Annie grew up in temperate Victoria, Australia, but always knew that she wanted to become a marine biologist someday. Through a very windy path, she discovered the power of genetics to answer important ecological questions and to create conservation plans based on a species' DNA. She finally had the opportunity to apply her newfound love of genetics to her favorite group of animals, corals. For the past several years, Annie has used genetics to study how we might be able to help corals survive the onslaught of issues they're currently facing, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef. Annie and I nerd out over so many topics, including population genetics, coral biology and reproduction strategies, the issues our reefs are facing, and how we all can make our corals' lives a little easier. If you're enjoying the show and think a friend might enjoy it too, be sure to send them this episode. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow. Also, if you'd like to be some of the first to hear about new podcast shenanigans, head on over to rewildology.com and sign up for the monthly newsletter. Don't worry, fun emails only. And quickly, before we dive into the episode, I wanted to give you a quick heads up that Annie recorded her audio in a busy lab setting, so you might hear a few moments of commotion here and there. However, I felt that the conversation was so good that hopefully you won't mind the occasional sound. With some help, I did my best to remove as much background noise as possible for you. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Annie. Oh, well, awesome, Annie. Thank you so much for sitting down today and diving into this topic. I'm so excited to learn from you because after watching, I don't know how many documentaries and reading so many articles and everything, I'm so excited to talk about this with somebody who knows what's going on. So before I spoil the beans about what you do and why you're so amazing, please tell us who are are you? Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And, and what's your journey? Where, why did you get to what you're doing today? Mm, mm. So I, I suppose these days I mainly call myself a marine biologist, um, but I haven't always been. <laughs> I, um, I grew up down in Victoria in Australia uh, in a temperate kind of forest area. So like picture big tall mountain ash trees and big tall tree ferns um and so like very very far from coral reefs which I now study um but I was really really lucky that as a kid um, my family used to take trips to go visit the Great Barrier Reef um and so I got immersed in one of these natural wonders super early um and I loved it from the get-go so I was like one of those kids that you like stuck in the water and you just couldn't get them out of the water because I just <laughs> loved being in there and there's so much going on and so many exciting things to look at and yes yeah, so even as a kid I think I always loved loved the reef um, and so I was kind of moving through my high school years and I was thinking you know, in the back of my mind that marine biology would be a really cool thing to do because I loved science and I loved the water and it just kind of logically made sense but I got 
to the time where I had to kind of choose what I was going to do. And I very much kind of had this moment of like, I don't feel ready to leave my home like area. Um, so how could I be a marine biologist that's living in a temperate forest in Victoria, which is cold and so very far from the reef. So yeah, like I said, I loved science. Um, so it's kind of at this point of like, I don't know what sort of science I want to do anymore. Um, so I ended up taking on like a double degree. Um, which let me do uh, biomedical science, so like all about the human biology. Um, and I took a science degree as well, which meant that I could study all of these beautiful different kind of aspects of science. So, you know, I was doing like human anatomy or I was studying rocks and I was studying the ocean and I was studying, you know, animals all the way in Africa, like in a day. You know? So it was this um, really fun kind of immersion into, into science. And there was like this really particular uh, subject that I took through my, my university. And I basically sat down in this lecture and the lecturer, um, Paul Sonex, was talking about how we can use DNA and molecular tools to try and find out more about the environment. So how can we learn more about the environment? And even more than that, how can we use these tools to try and conserve natural wonders? And I just sat there in this lecture and I was like, this, this is me and this is what I want to do. Um, so yeah, I ended up um, going down that path. So I was very much like a population geneticist. So again, that's just trying to look at DNA because DNA tells us the history of a species and what it's been through. And it can tell us or give us indications of what it's capable of. And it tells us what exists in what areas and what sort of species exist and what sort of areas are really important for us to conserve. And so I very much deep dived into, into that sort of science. Um, but throughout my undergrad and even um, throughout you know, some later studies and work I was doing, I realized I still really wanted to be a marine biologist. Um, so I ended up taking a PhD, uh, which was based up at the Australian Institute of Marine Science up in Townsville. So opposite kind of ends of the East Coast of Australia. <laughs> um, so I was finally ready to jump, <laughs> jump ship. And I moved up here, which is where I am now, talking to you now from, uh, so in Townsville. And I ended up taking this PhD with Madeline Van Oppen. And what it involves is looking at whether or not we can try and breed corals for reef restoration. So we're seeing reef de degradation happening on a really alarming and worrying scale. Um, and restoration is this one approach to try and stop some of that degradation or restore reefs after degradation. And so my PhD is all about whether you can breed corals in particular ways to make them the best possible uh, stock for reef restoration that we might be able to protect our reefs. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of how I got to where I am and what I'm doing now. <laughs> So cool. That is so cool. And I would, before we get into corals itself, mm -hmm. I would love to chat more about this genetic side. Mm -hmm. um, having taken some genetics myself, like it is such a fascinating topic to think about things on this level. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, could you almost give us like a little lesson in genetics? Like you, you mentioned population genetics. Mm -hmm. Why is this so important? What kind of mm -hmm. answers can we get by studying this very particular topic of nature and what mm -hmm. it is that creates us? So please just give us a little genetics lesson before we get yeah. back into coral <laughs> reefs. That would be uh -huh. wonderful. I, I would love to. This is like the stuff I nerd out about. Okay, most good. For nerd sure. hard. I want the nerd. Let's go. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, well, Dina is like so cool for so many different reasons, right? Um, I um, so I very much come from like a population genetics background. So what that means is I been using DNA and the information in DNA to try and figure out more about populations of different species. Um, so for like example, what nature is really fascinating for, but also really tricky to try and work out is that you can get two different species um, that have actually been diverged for thousands and thousands of years, but look the same. And so if we just look at what something looks like, physically looks like, we'll put them in the same category. Mm. And that has really important implications, not only for 
human knowledge and finding out what exists where, but so much of what we do for conservation is based on what we call things. And so if we're calling an apple an orange, then we're actually working to protect apples, but we need to be working to protect oranges. So the beauty of using DNA is that you can actually look at this molecular scale and look at how different things are. So DNA mutates and it's just this natural process that's happened over time and it's the, the material of which natural selection works on. And so natural selection has worked throughout all of our existence to try and um, create or select for different organisms. And that's how we've ended up with the beautiful massive diversity of different species that we have on our planet today. Um, but what you can actually do is you can use the information in mutations. So for example, if we've got two different um, populations of what we thought was the same species, and we can look at the number of different mutations that those two populations have, Based on that, plus knowing how quickly DNA mutates, so how frequently mutations happen over time by looking at the number of differences and looking at that rate, we can tell how long these two different species have been evolving separately from one another. And so you can look at that on a species scale. You can also look at it at a population scale. So, you know, is a, for example, on the Great Barrier Reef, is a population that's right up at the top of the reef, is that connected to a population right down on the bottom? And so you can look at things like gene flow. So are there mutations moving from one population to another? So through migrants, so for example, with corals, are we getting little coral larvae, which are the migratory phase of corals? Are they getting moved and spread all the way down these vast systems or are they very separate? And so therefore, again, from like a management perspective, should we be treating those two things as the same or should we be treating these two things as different? And so that's the beauty of looking at molecular tools. And so this is kind of like very much from like a population side, but we can also look at even more information in DNA because DNA can tell us what a species is capable of. So mm. if you imagine um, genetic mutations as like the evolutionary toolbox of a species, so the more different types of genetic variants that a species has, then the more equipped that species is at trying to deal with different environmental changes. So what you can do is you can look at a species, you can see well, what's in its toolbox, what, is, what does that species have at its disposal and what might it be capable of? And so that becomes really important when we're looking at the current environment that we live in today where climate change is causing extreme stresses in many different ecosystems. Can species deal with those stresses? Do they have the tools that they require to deal with those stresses? And DNA can tell us about that. And so there's so many different things that DNA can do for us just both with telling us about why things are the way they are, helping to explain beautiful natural beauty, but also how can we protect it in the best way possible? Oh, that was fantastic. And there's so <laughs> many examples going through my head. And this is why inbreeding is so bad because you get all these deleterious cells coming together, well, genes coming mm -hmm. together. Um, and I mean, like me, I guess, you know, big cats are my thing and I won't shut up about them, but like cheetahs, mm -hmm. that is why it's so difficult for them because they went through a, a massive bottleneck. And now a mm -hmm. lot of them, they don't have like almost zero diversity in their species, which is why they are so vulnerable. And I love exactly. that you brought up the speciation thing, even, um, but more on the molecular level versus just looking at them. The perfect example, I just love when my episodes cross over each other because my yeah. one of my next episodes that it'll be coming out before this one, um, she's an cool. armadillo expert and cool. her and also one of my other, he's actually going to be released this week. Um, they both work for the IUCN and wow. well, like as specialists for the IUCN. And now that all this genetic work is going on and they're finding that there are significantly more species than previously thought. Mm -hmm. that the implications of this are huge. Like mm -hmm. when we actually find out what the populations are for these species that we didn't even know were species because we thought they were just one like glob of things. And it's like, actually, mm -hmm. you're like three species. Mm -hmm. And in that yeah. episode, Mariella even talks about that. So when she, like I said, she's an armadillo expert and not many people are studying armadillos. And one species that they thought was one species is actually three. And so wow. what type of conservation decision do you make on that when you just now know that you have three species that you're working with and have no idea what their population is or let alone how to conserve them 
So mm-hmm. yeah, it, this is like a huge wave on the front of conservation and will hopefully give us way more just tools to work with, to make better decisions. Cause just like you said, and we're getting ready to get into very soon, like conserving genetic diversity is just as important as just like the species itself. So, mm-hmm. Oh, thank you for nerding out with me on that. I haven't been able to nerd out on genetics in a really long time. Oh, I remember taking that class too. And my, yeah. Oh my God, my professor was the most boring person of all time, but the class itself was really interesting because I had never been exposed yeah. to this way of thinking that like yeah. all the way down on a molecular level is actually shaping <sighs> everything oh it's so cool so cool okay, okay so i want to yes yes <laughs> i right. couldn't imagine it that something so beautiful just exists and has existed for so long and there's just so much there's so much story in that too so much history in that it's beautiful yes and speaking of so let's switch gears and i want you to nerd out again on <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> <laughs> on your particular study subject, and that's coral reefs. So before we get into the conservation stuff of what you're doing, could you give us some like natural history and just explain what corals themselves are? Because they Mm -hmm. look very different than what they Mm -hmm. actually are. And sometimes it might be easy to confuse them with other things. So give us like, this is what coral reefs are talk, (laughs) essentially. Yeah, well, it's, it's such a, um, there's so much misunderstanding around coral reefs, I think, from particularly the general kind of public, um, because even those who've been snorkeling, you stack your eyes under water level and it looks like this completely different world. Like, it's so hard to really identify what things are and how they all fit together. And it just is, it always blows your mind, you know? So I think that often we don't really know what those building blocks are because it seems so foreign, but coral reefs themselves are actually built by corals. And so corals are what we say that they are these ecosystem engineers that just by growing on top of one another and building and constructing, they form these beautiful reef masses. And corals themselves are actually animals. So they're not plants, um, they're animals. And uh, a coral even in itself is even more bizarre in that um, a coral colony, which you might see as like one kind of branching structure, is actually made up of many, many different individuals. And so that's why it's called a colony, because it's many different animals within the one colony. But from a genetic sense, each of those individuals is a clone of the other ones. And so you're actually looking at one kind of genetic individual, but many, many different individuals. And so those corals themselves, they grow and they build these beautiful skeletons, which then become the structure or the foundation of reefs. And so then you've got things colonizing those reefs. And so they cause or they build the home that everything else lives and exists on. Nice. And what is the estimate of how old corals are? When did they come to be on this planet? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's really interesting with corals because you can see that um, when you see seas, for example, um, regress or transgress. So we know th- throughout history we've got melting and we've got refreezing of um ice on land masses that's associated with that is our oceans will actually expand as they melt and then they'll shrink as they freeze and so our reefs themselves have been going through this journey of moving their boundaries over time for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and we actually know that in very, very deep fossil records. They were existing or some form or predecessor was existing somewhere very, very, very early on because we know that our marine ecosystem actually was the first to evolve large structures, um, large structures like those that we now see in corals. Um, So the ancestors were around for a very, very long time. But however, they have been dealing with these changes and these selection pressures over time that are quite prominent in their DNA, for example. <laughs> yeah, back to DNA, which is so Back to DNA. Cool. It always comes it's amazing back. DNA. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. This molecule that we call DNA is in everything from the tree outside to our bodies to coral reefs, like things that don't look anything mm-hmm. alike. And it's just mm-hmm. how those... What is it? A G. I'm going. What are the? 
C and T. C and T. There it is. Okay, okay. It's been a hot second. It's been a hot second. Since I had to like make <laughs> DNA structures. Um, yeah. But just like these four things. And it's just like, wow, it just creates all the diversity of life, which is absolutely incredible. It's wild, hey? So you've definitely explained why corals are so important and how they are like, a, they're an ecosystem engineer. They are really in, in a keystone species as well. Like they have a huge importance in the area that they're in. Which brings me to my next point, which is they're definitely in trouble. And as lots of things are right now, as we know, but what exactly is going on with our corals and our coral reefs? If you wouldn't mind explaining what, what from a science scientific standpoint is going on with Mm -hmm. them right now? Yeah, of course. So corals, themselves I talked about the fact that they're these colonies of many different individuals what's even more wild is that the coral themselves actually has a whole ecosystem growing within it as well so it's got bacteria that live within it and have symbiotic relationships with it it's got viruses that live within it and again some of them may be symbiotic as well and we've also got um, these really important components of corals, which are called the Symbiodiniaceae, but they're, imagine these little tiny algal cells. And these algae are really important to corals and corals are really important to these algae. So if you imagine a coral, if you've ever seen one before, if you look it up, you often see that they have these beautiful and uh, bright colors to them. And those colors are actually coming from the algae that live inside the coral. So the algae will take the sunlight, they'll photosynthesize, and they'll create nutrients and food, which they then feed the coral. So they're living inside the coral tissue, and they pass all of those nutrients across to the corals. And the corals give those algae a place to exist and a place to live. And so it's this really important symbiotic relationship. The problem is, well, one of the main problems we're seeing on coral reefs at the moment is climate change resulting in rises in sea surface temperatures and also we're seeing an increased frequency with which we're getting these really extreme kind of summer heat waves Um, and those conditions are really stressful and under stressful conditions like those we find that our corals will lose their algal symbionts and so that's this process that we call coral bleaching we call it coral bleaching because when the coral loses its colorful algae it then becomes white and bleached Now, because the coral now is existing without this really important symbiont that gives us food, it can often starve as a result and die. So in response to these extreme stresses like high temperatures or bleaching heat waves, we see large numbers of corals lose their algal symbionts and die. And as a result of that, we're seeing large scale reef degradation because if the very founders of reef are dying, then you can only imagine that that structure is eroding and the complexity in all of the homes that every other organism relies upon start to disappear. And so that's the reason why these, these, this seemingly small interaction upon this like large and diverse reefs becomes so fundamentally important to that persistence of that huge and diverse ecosystem. So would you say that a good analogy would be for maybe someone who's more um, familiar with terrestrial ecosystems is Mm -hmm. like cutting down the Amazon and then where's Mm -hmm. all of those like species going to go that live within the trees and that really biodiverse area. So is that, is is that like an equivalent ish from like a land to water version? Yeah. And we can even go closer to home. You know, what if you imagined yourself without your gut microbiome, you would starve because you don't have the organisms living inside you that feed you. You end up getting really, really sick and you end up losing all of the micronutrients that help you to survive as an individual. And it's the same way with corals. Once they lose that, they're gone. And then if you amplify that up, for example, with trees, once you lose the trees, the whole forest loses its existence. Mm. Oh, that's a great example, microbiome. I love that you just brought that in there. <laughs> that was so good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where like antibiotics and stuff are just so bad. For, well, potentially if you don't recolonize your body correctly. So yeah. then, okay. So we definitely know that this is a big problem 
And we've seen, I'm sure everybody listening has seen pictures of coral bleaching and what's going on. Is there a percent or any sort of statistics that are available yet of how many reefs have been bleached mm. or what the rate is or anything that you could share with us of how big of a scale this is? Yeah. Um, <laughs> massive is a one place, one word I would use. <laughs> um, on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, we had some back to back mass bleaching events. And in mm. fact, we've just been experiencing another bleaching event. So that makes it 2016, 2017, 2020, 2022. Mm. We're seeing huge bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef. And there's some data that came out that after the 2016 and 27 back to back mass bleaching events, we lost nearly or about half of the corals. Oh my God, I just got goosebumps. 50%, yeah, 50% of the corals. Now, reefs are incredible and they can rebound and they can regrow if we give them enough time or if they're given enough time. But when you're seeing back-to-back -back mass bleaching events compounding with other stresses like Deep, like nutrients getting into the water and polluting our waterways, when we're seeing massive disease outbreaks, pest outbreaks, we're seeing cyclones, all of these things, when they're happening at incredible frequency, there's not enough time for such a volume of corals and animals to then repopulate those areas. And so we're seeing large scale degradation and too rapidly, that becomes a really key point, we're seeing rapid degradation. And is there any connection between those specific years? Was there a certain event that we can then predict or was it surprising? Or what was so special about these years? Oh, <laughs> they're closest to the present, unfortunately. That's what it becomes about is we're just seeing large scale climate change. And in fact, the IPCC report, the most recent one, was predicting that we're going to get... Um, bleaching waves annually so every year something by the middle of the century um, so that means we're getting these mass heat waves which we've seen cause mass destruction happening every year and you imagine what sort of time are we giving these animals and these ecosystems to um, to restore their populations to rebuild to then guard themselves against the next onslaught mm. Well, everyone's probably like, thank you, Brooke and Nanny, for thinking that our oceans are just dying. So <laughs> now that we've definitely have thoroughly described how bad it is. Oh, no. Let's, let's change. I mean, but this is the thing. We're scientists. This we got to be realistic. This is what is happening. There is no sugarcoating it anymore. Yes, there are all of these clickbait headlines that we see all the time, but this is actually what the scientists are seeing on the ground. You are in the reef. You've seen this stuff. You know what's going on. You're Australian. Like, this is your barrier reef. Like, you, you've you seen this. So then let's get to what is going on to as us as humans that are trying to help in some way. So let's explore your work and your research and you know everything that your lab is doing so what are these genetic mm -hmm. tools that you are employing and researching to see what we can do to help with our corals yeah um so i suppose um just your first statement as well really made me think um because it can be this kind of catastrophizing like we, we think oh it's all dying what's the point but I do really want to stress as well that corals are incredible and they do naturally deal with stresses like these, with bleaching similar heat waves. They also deal with things like cyclones, like they've evolved to be capable um, to some capacity. And so, you know, some parts of the reef, for example, during those heat waves, it wasn't every part of the reef that died and was degraded, significant portions of it did, but some survived. And so there is this beautiful and innate capacity of reefs to survive. Um, and so it is worth researching and it is worth conserving and it is worth fighting for. And I guess the tools that I'm particularly working with is about how can we help corals themselves deal 
with these environments so we know that they have some capacity how can we help how can we give them greater capacity and greater resilience in the face of these stresses so that they might evolve quickly enough to keep up with environmental change and so more specifically the work that i'm doing is all about breeding corals so can we breed corals in certain ways to make them for example the most genetically diverse so when they have the most number of tools at their disposal to try and deal with environmental change or can we it's more particularly breed corals to be more resilient so for example can we breed corals that are going to be more resilient to high temperatures and so the idea is if we can breed corals with these traits in large numbers we might be able to breed them and use those corals to try and counter some of the degradation that's happening. So can we then outplant those corals into a reef environment and boost population numbers with stock that's going to be the most advantageous under future environmental conditions to try and give those reefs and broader ecosystems some kind of a chance? That sounds amazing. And how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love the idea of what's the application. How do you do that? Yeah. yeah, totally. So corals are so wonderful for so many different reasons. Um, but one of the beautiful things that um, corals do is they breed in ways that are really advantageous for us to be able to harness those breeding approaches for managed breeding. So corals themselves, um, many of the corals that build our reefs are what we call broadcast spawn. So this means um, that often, uh, particularly, well, not particularly, but on the Great Barrier Reef, for example, we have um, many of our reef building corals, the foundation of our reefs. Those individuals will spawn a certain number of nights after the full moon. Um, and it can happen, you know, once or twice throughout the year. Um, and those corals will release their eggs and their sperm up into the ocean. And so the eggs and the sperm of one coral will then find the eggs and sperm of another coral and they'll cross fertilize to then create coral larvae, which are those swimming kind of life stages of a coral. And those swimming larvae will then attach and they'll metamorphose into that sedentary or that sessile coral recruit that we see growing on reefs. And so because these corals will naturally release their eggs and sperm, it means that we can collect corals and we can collect those eggs and those sperm and we can cross them in very controlled ways. So we can take the eggs of one colony, mix them with sperm of another colony with the intention of trying to breed coral stock that are going to be more resilient and are more genetically diverse. Mm. And then how do you test that? How do you find mm. who is the winner in the genetic race and during your experiments? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So I kind of uh, approach managed breeding or I have approached managed breeding from a couple of different angles um, up until now. So one of my um, experiments just formed a, a portion of my PhD uh, was looking at when we mix eggs and sperm in different ways, um, so say if we take the eggs of six different individuals and we mix them with the sperm of six different individuals, are they all randomly mating with one another? So all mm. six individuals and parents going to be contributing to the offspring that we're producing? Or are those eggs and sperm a little more picky? So maybe one of the corals actually releases um, sperm that are a little bit dud and that don't get put into the mix. <laughs> or maybe one of them is a really strong performer and they end up contributing a lot to the mix. And maybe there's even more intricate dynamics going on. So maybe one coral doesn't like another coral, but will mate or cross fertilize with a third coral. And so the idea is what sort of dynamics are happening because we don't know much about this. And so that has implications because if we're, putting eggs and sperm into a bucket, which is literally what we do sometimes, put them into a bucket, are we actually getting a representation of all of the individuals from which we've collected from? And so um, I've been using molecular tools to try and investigate that. So what we did was we collected up, we mixed eggs and sperm of different individuals, and then we used this parentage analysis. So we looked at the DNA in the offspring that were created by those mixes of eggs and sperm. And looking at their DNA, we could tell 
who their parents were. And so in doing that, we could identify, so similar to the way that um, parentage tests are done in humans, you know, you can look at your DNA and say, okay, where did my DNA came, come from? In the same way you can look at corals, where did their DNA came, come from? And so in doing that, we could identify the number of individuals that are involved in that mix and what sort of genetic diversity we're getting, which again is really important because if we're getting all of the individuals in the mix, then we might be getting really genetically diverse offspring, which are really equipped to different environmental conditions. So if we put them out on the reef, they might give that reef as many as possible tools to try and deal with environmental change. On the inverse, if we're actually resulting in a pool of offspring that's genetically depauperate because only some of the individuals have been contributing and only some of the genetic combinations, then that stock, if you're going to put it onto a reef in a worst case scenario you can actually reduce the number of or the um the number of tools that that reef has at its disposal and you're actually reducing its evolutionary capacity um and so yeah by using molecular tools we've been investigating investigating that have you found anything yet? That is like so fascinating because when we think of sexual selection, we think of actual like individuals seeking each other, but this is literally yeah. the gametes seeking each other. Is there yeah. any, have you found or discovered any sort of selection mechanism that these, like the egg or the sperm are doing? Like, how do they decide? Like, I want to mate with you, you know, like this <laughs> egg that's floating in the ocean. Like, oh, uh -huh. this is so cool. Is that, uh -huh. what's the selection process? Yeah, so that is something that I want to know so much more about. We don't know much about corals, <laughs> but this in particular, we don't know much about coral. About um, So, for example, we do know that some um, coral eggs will release these chemicals into the water that actually attract certain sperm to swim towards them. And so this is oh. kind of this choosing mechanism in this. Um, we also know with uh, broadcast spawners in other species outside of corals, then they have these kind of lock and key mechanisms where this egg knows that this sperm is of the same species and that they're compatible with one another because it's literally like the egg will have a lock and the sperm will have a key and so the sperm can then attach to the egg and cross fertilize them. So it's really important to know what sort of mechanisms exist uh, and it's really important we're working with corals because it would make our life so much easier if we could cross corals that we knew would cross fertilize with one another. So for example, there are some populations of corals that have already become incredibly genetically depauperate and degraded for dealing with mm. large stresses, climate change, disease populations, all these kinds of things like, for example, in the Caribbean. And when you're trying to do selective or managed breeding programs, you can actually end up with a lot of waste if you're taking the eggs of an individual and you mix them together with a sperm of a different individual and those in eggs, eggs and sperm were never actually going to cross because they don't actually like each other. They're not compatible with one another. Mm. And so what happens is that mass of eggs and that mass of sperm then becomes wasted. It's wasted effort. It's wasted material. So if we could identify the mechanisms that are important in determining whether an individual will like another individual, then we don't get that kind of waste and we could then more targetedly cross individuals that we know will cross. And so we know we're going to get some stock resulting from those so it is really important for us to know we don't know enough yet in mm. that space oh my gosh I have so many questions this is awesome <laughs> I'm like nerding out right now this is so much fun <laughs> so in your sperm and egg bucket experiments mm -hmm. what kind of genetic diversity are you seeing out of those is it random or you like are you seeing trends are you seeing gen like genetically diverse offspring how how are those going yeah, so we've um, we've just fin kind of finished working on on this work, and what we found was um, that it depends on depended on how you did the crosses. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So if you mix the eggs and the sperm together, so you've taken the eggs from different individuals and mix them with the sperm of different individuals, and you put them together in a bucket, and and you look at the offspring, you are seeing. Some of the individuals were not very successful at contributing, so they weren't, didn't produce, you know, very successful gametes. Other individuals produced very successful gametes, and so there was a lot of their genetic information in the pool of offspring that were created. And we definitely saw some picking and choosing where some colonies would cross-fertilise with um, one one individual, but wouldn't cross fertilize with another individual, at least with the same kind of level of success. So we are seeing a reduction 
in the gene pool of the offspring that we're creating. We also did a different kind of cross. So when a coral releases its eggs and its sperm up into the water column, it actually releases them as these bundle packages. So basically, this is kind of getting a little bit deep on the biology. Side. Oh, I love it. Let's, let's go all the way. This is, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, my biologist, like, gene, I'm just tingling right now. Just keep going. Because <laughs> uh, corals are so magical. You just can't imagine that these things have evolved to do this. So like, yeah, a couple of, um, yeah, that night, you know, that they, that they're going to be spawning before they spawn, the polyp individual kind of will suck itself down into the tissue and it kind of prepares for its spawning. So what happens is its eggs and its sperm in the inside, the polyp and all of the cilia working together to kind of package those eggs and sperm into these bundle packages. And so it's taking the eggs and taking the sperm and mixing them together into these packages. And then the polyp will present those packages on the surface of the coral. And so it gets this appearance, appearance where before it was out feeding with its polyp fingers all kind of searching through the water for food. It then sucked those polyps in and got a really flat appearance. And then once its bundles are ready to spawn, it kind of projects those bundles on the surface. So you end up getting this really bumpy, or like pimply kind of mm. appearance to the corals. And that's how when we're watching them, we know that the coral is likely to be about to spawn. So when the coral then spawns, it releases those bundle packages and it's one of the most magical things you can ever see. And if you haven't seen it before, look it up and watch a video because it's it's purely magical. It's like inverse snowing. Um, <laughs> and so they get released and those bundle packages are buoyant. And so they actually rise up through the water column and they come to the surface. And so this is what reduces the journey of an egg and a sperm to have to find one another all the way through a massive ocean to a smaller distance because all of the bundles end up concentrated together up the water surface. So what we have also done is we've taken bundle packages from different corals. And rather than separating those bundles into eggs and sperm and then combining them in a controlled way, we've just taken the packages from one mm. individual and another and another and another and mixed them together in a bucket. And we actually found that sometimes, or in our case at least, we saw that those crosses could have the most genetic diversity. And so it could be that by separating out eggs and sperm in that handling and that process, we actually are causing some kind of restrictions in the gametic ability to cross fertilize with one another. And so rather if we just take the bundle packages from one another, we could also get more genetic diversity in our crosses, which is really convenient because if you're thinking <laughs> about trying to breed corals at a huge scale, mm. which is you know what we're looking at and already scalability is probably one of the number one limiting factors of reef restoration initiatives is trying how are we going to possibly do this at a scale that's going to be useful to reefs. Um, anything that makes the process more efficient is helpful. So taking the bundle packages, for example, that doesn't require all that handling could actually be um, a really beneficial way to kind of generate large stock for, for reef restoration initiatives. Oh, that's so cool. Just using the packages that nature's already made. <laughs> exactly. Like, Isn't it beautiful? Thank you, Mother reminder? Nature. You already got yeah. done. Let me just yeah. put them <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's totally. so cool. That's so cool. Sometimes as scientists, we overthink things. Like, yeah, I'll have to bring it down all the way down to the egg and the sperm. When it's like, actually, we just yeah. kept it like that and it's good. That's, yeah. I mean, that's so cool, but you don't know until you know. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, until you had to do those experiments. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So let's take now, let's take it up a step. So you mm -hmm. have your little babies, your little baby corals. So mm -hmm. then are they put then underneath different stressors to see how they do genetically? Or what is the next mm -hmm. step to determine mm -hmm. what type of coral might be able to be mass scale produced to recolonate our reefs? So yeah, what's mm -hmm. the next step? So there's so many things we need to know about stock to know whether they're useful. Um, so another really well significant portion of my PhD studies has been looking at how, what we term interspecific hybridization. So what that involves is crossing corals of different species with mm. one another. So because we can know that we can get the eggs and we can get the sperm of different individuals, what we can do is we can cross the eggs of one species and mix them together with the sperm of another species to create these interspecific hybrids. And the reason that these hybrids might be useful is there's a few different reasons, but 
firstly, by taking the genes of the genetic variants of one species and mixing them together with the genetic variants of a different species, we're actually creating new genetic combinations. And sometimes those genetic combinations can actually make those corals more resilient. And so there's some evidence of this in different systems where the hybrids of different corals and sometimes even natural hybrids um, that occur, for example, in the Caribbean um, can be more resilient to things like disease and predation compared to purebred individuals. Um, a really long term stress um, test was conducted uh, at my workplace. And uh, what it was looking at was if we grew hybrid corals and purebred corals under both ambient climate conditions and future climate conditions where we're expecting more acidic waters and higher temperatures, how do the hybrids perform relative to the purebreds? And there were some instances where the hybrids could survive or grow better than the purebreds um, corals in these cases. And so my PhD has been really kind of expanding on, on this project. It's like, okay, so sometimes under aquarium and very controlled conditions, we can see that hybrids and purebreds can, uh, hybrids can um, outperform purebreds. But if hybrids were ever going to be outplanted, how do those hybrids perform in their natural environment becomes mm. really important. So are hybrids capable of surviving in a reef environment? So if we put them into the wild. And so that's been one part of what my PhD project has been. I've also been testing um, hybrid and purebred corals and comparing their performance to uh, increased uh, or extreme summer heat waves. So for example, it simulated the 2020 bleaching uh, event, the temperature wave that happened on the Great Barrier Reef and caused bleaching here. Um, I tested that and simulated it in an aquarium environment to see how hybrids and purebreds performed relative to one another. And so looking at the fitness of these, what we say first generation hybrids becomes really important under different conditions. How do they go in the wild? How do they go under different environmentally relevant conditions? Something else that becomes really, really important is, okay, so we can take the eggs and the sperm of different species, we can create first generation hybrids. Those hybrids themselves are also more genetically diverse because you're getting all of these new different combinations. And so you can actually boost stock diversity just through conducting interspecific hybridization. But those hybrids, can they actually contribute to reef restoration if you put them out beyond this first generation? And so what's been really important and what I've been also investigating with my team is looking at whether or not coral hybrids are capable of reproducing. So a really classic example of looking at hybrid reproduction is the mule. So for example, when you take a donkey and a horse, you get a mule, and it's quite commonly known that the mule itself isn't capable of reproducing. We don't know much about coral hybrids and what they're capable of and whether they can reproduce. And so I've been investigating this. And the reason it's important is because if you put a hybrid out into the reef, is it capable of propagating? So can it create another generation, which again is going to have more genetic combinations and again, create more offspring and rebuild reefs. On top of that, hybrids have got this other really kind of potential benefit is that if you imagine the hybrid itself has got the combinations of genes from two species, if that hybrid is actually able to reproduce back or back cross with individuals from one of the species, then because it's got the genes of both species, it can actually introduce the genes of the second species into the first species. So for example, if you're crossing two species and one species has got this genetic variant that makes that second species more temperature resilient, then the hybrid may inherit that variant and then by crossing with individuals of populations from the other species, it can introduce that temperature resilient genetic variant into that second population and theoretically make that other species more resilient. And so hybrid reproduction is really important because it determines a lot of their potential. So yeah, it's really key to kind of study, study any kind of restoration tool. So for example, I speak about hybrids because that's what I work with, but any restoration tool about both the ability for those um, that coral stock to help the present um, generation and help rebuild under all of these different stresses that we know are hitting our reefs, but also what's the longevity of these tools that we're trying to implement? Can those 
propagate on reefs and therefore make them scalable and more usable at large scale restoration. And do do you feel like you're getting close? Are there actual restoration projects, like successful restoration projects going on? Or what mm-hmm. is the current status of this mm-hmm. as we speak? Yeah, so reef restoration itself um, is really being considered very recently, I suppose I would say. So we've seen large scale reef degradation happening for a very long time. Um, However, doing these kind of active management approaches, they're very um, uh, cost costly Mm. they also take a lot of time um, and also the feasibility of trying to implement that of large scales has always been this kind of like inhibitory factor Mm. the problem is that we're now seeing such extreme degradation that these tools need to be considered and so that's where we're at now we're starting to consider using these active management tools they're still in their infancy so we don't know a lot about all of these different tools we certainly don't know how to make these tools scalable to make them applicable at a large enough scale to create large scale restoration but there's so many different lines of research so i'm just one tiny drop in this ocean of many different research approaches trying to figure out how we might create tools to help reefs and they all pair with each other really nicely so for example this research that i'm doing is like can we breed the coral host to be more resilient. Well, some other people are researching, can we make the algal symbionts more resilient? Oh, wow. And then there's other, yeah. And then there's other research, it's cool, hey? And then other research looking at the bacteria of corals, can we make their bacteria more resilient? Then there's research looking at, okay, if we create corals with all of these, you know, resilient packages, what's the best way to put them on reefs? Can we create tools and devices for planting corals onto reefs at large scales? There's also research looking at large um, generation of coral stock that are in their larval form and then transplanting those concentrated larvae onto degraded reef formies to try and repopulate reefs. And so there's all of these different lines of research Mm. kind of going on all beautifully kind of at the same time, but it is now is the time that it's all kind of starting. Um, so there's still so much that we don't know. Wow. That's so cool. I had no idea that there were so many different lines that are all happening at the exact same time. And I can see how yeah. each of those would be so helpful in every single way. Yeah. And like, and what I love about that, it doesn't sound like they're mutually exclusive. There's probably yeah. multiple solutions that are being worked on right now that will all help in some way, yeah. shape or form once we yeah. finally get this on a big enough, like, on, like you said, on scalability, like on a big enough scale where this will make a difference. And mm-hmm. it's, it just sucks that time is not on our side right now. It just, it just isn't. So That's what, the other thing. yeah, yeah. Actually go and go into that. What, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure that the pressure is on, which sometimes is good because it gets a lot of action, but sometimes it's bad because then like keeping science good could sometimes be difficult. So yeah, what's that like working on such a tight schedule, I guess to say, mm-hmm. for lack of better terms, on this issue? Mm-hmm. It makes it a really controversial time for sure mm. um, because there's a lot of research all going to trying to go on concurrently and we're trying to learn from one another, but trying to, you know, get the conversation happening in a really um, clear ways. It's really difficult, a kind of thing to, to navigate. Um, there's also other really important foundational research that we just don't know. For example, mm. we don't even know the lock and key mechanisms between <laughs> the eggs and sperm of corals, you know? Like yeah, that's so, so important. <laughs> So many really important things that we don't know, but at the same time, we're trying to generate these tools that are going to help reef restoration. So it's trying to also get this foundational bank of knowledge. Another really good example in corals is corals um, historically have been identified based on what they look like. And so Mm. um, we look at corals and we say, okay, these look kind of the same. They're probably the same species. We've put them in the same box as a species. The problem is that corals are particularly tricky because do corals that are very different 
um, can evolve to have had the same appearance, but they're actually tens of thousands of years diverged from one another, but they've just co-evolved to look the same as one another. We also have the same species or the same individual, like the same genetic type of in genetic individual can look different based on where it grows on the reef. So if you put it in one on kind of environment reef. Oh on the same reef, the same individual <laughs> will look totally different if you put it up the top or down the bottom. You know, like so where the, it's it's really fraught with with problems. And the molecular tools that are now enabling us to look at these species are only just starting to be applied in coral reef science. And there's some beautiful work going on to try and figure out what different things are. But even that is still at its infancy. So we don't even know what sort of species we're working with. And so this kind of foundational research is also really, really important. The trick is trying to balance the two, right? So how do we make sure that we've got enough foundational knowledge to be able to create tools that are going to be of benefit, but also not jumping the gun and trying to create these tools that are um, that we don't have enough knowledge to back up? Or if we just spend all our time doing the foundational knowledge, then it could very well come to a step, come to the um, come to a head that we're actually don't have any we haven't spent any time figuring out how we're going to fix the problem and so we're going to get to the point of knowing a lot about a reef that we can't save anymore because mm. it's beyond saving because we haven't got this bank of tools so trying to balance the two is really important and it's so important that we that we really harness the collaboration that can exist between those and that's going to be that's going to be the answer to trying to preserve reefs in the best way that we can what I should say as well and what I do want to say <laughs> is that when we are looking at um, coral reef restoration, for example, I don't see these things as a solution. They're trying to help. Um, we're trying to buy time. We're trying to somewhat mediate the degradation that's happening. But this is all just trying to buy time while larger scale action is taken. And when we're talking about coral reefs, the main action that needs to happen is action against climate change. If we can actually stop the stress that these corals and these reefs are experiencing by mitigating our emissions and mitigating climate change and mitigating the changes in sea surface temperatures that we're seeing, that's what's going to give the diversity on coral reefs the best chance. And so all of these tools are just trying to help the situation, which needs to be dealt with at a much larger scale. And that scale can be dealt with by all of us. You know, it's not just reef scientists, it's not just, you know, those of us who is here who live close to the reef who are studying it, people who are so removed in cities far removed from reefs, their actions can also help reefs. And that's so much at such a bigger scale than these kinds of tools can kind of mitigate. Mm, I love that you bring that up because one of the questions that I, I love to ask pretty much every guest is what can we do to help? What can me literally across the world? I could not be further away from you than I am right now. <laughs> How can someone like me who's in the Rocky Mountains of North America help mm -hmm. the Great Barrier Reef or anybody mm -hmm. else across the world, India, Africa? How can we help with this really important issue? Yeah, it's so much, <laughs> so much so. Um, so I think, yeah, there's so often this kind of disconnect um, between humanity and the natural world. It's almost like we see ourselves as separate. You know, we, we talk about the fact we went to go visit nature and I went into nature this weekend and I went to go see this natural beauty, but this kind of conversation, which we all use, what it negates is the fact that right now we're existing in it. We're a part of this natural world and it's so much bigger than us and so much we're so much more interdependent on this natural world than we ever give ourselves you know credit for I suppose so you know I think step one is re-engaging with that is realizing how dependent we are for example on coral reefs and how dependent coral reefs are on us to exist in a future environment and so you know for example when we're looking at coral reefs Sometimes it's hard when we're in a city that's, you know, thousands of kilometres away from reef to be like, well, 
you know, how how is my impact or how is that impacting me? Well, it's generating the food that's probably in the supermarket down the road. You know, so much of the food that people rely upon across the world comes fish from fisheries that are based on coral reefs. What about our coastal protection? Those reefs protect wave action from coastal erosion for any community who's living on in a coastal environment or those close to reefs are actually getting protected by their reefs day to day. It also harbours incredible cultural values, which are no small thing. Also aesthetic values, which is really important because as humans, we admire the natural wonders of the world. They're also really economically important. So for example, if we're looking at the Great Barrier Reef, the number of jobs that are dependent on the Great Barrier Reef are so numerous. And so many people's life livelihoods are dependent on reefs as well. So we can see in so many different ways we are dependent on reefs. When we try and flip that and think about our implications on reefs, even me today, you know, the way that I've been talking to you, it's it's often implied that we're causing damage, we're doing this, we're doing harm, our actions are causing degradation. And whilst unfortunately there's truth behind that, I think that language can also be problematic because no one wants to cause environmental destruction. And when people are told who are so far removed from a reef that their emissions are causing climate change, which is degrading reefs, because we're not even intending that, it makes you feel like just by existing, you're causing harm. Yes. And I think that that's really disheartening because you want to do your best for the environment, but just by doing you, you feel like all you can do is do harm. And so I think part of bringing that power back into us is by flipping that conversation. And so rather than thinking about all of our actions and the way that they're hurting reefs, think about the privilege that we have to nurture our reefs. So there are so many things that we can do in our day to day that we should be proud of because they will have implications on our safe reef environments and other components of our natural world. So for example, if you're in an um, if you if you have the privilege and the capacity to do it, riding your bike instead of you driving your car. Something as simple as that is both really great because it makes you feel really good, but also you can take pride in doing that because it's something that you've done for the natural world around you. And again, it gets you out in it and helps you reconnect just that little bit more, even just by being outside, for example, a car, just a little bit more in touch with the natural world around you. What about things that you put on your body you know if you're in an area that's going to be um where runoff is going to head to the ocean so most areas think about putting on chemicals that are going to be safe for those environments plastics for example huge issue we're seeing destructive volumes of plastics ending up in our oceans and they're getting broken down into microplastics which are going into our ocean organisms which are then getting fed back to us so they're seeing plastics being a huge issue as well by choosing to minimise the amount of plastic you use in your day to day, you are taking some pride in the way that you are nurturing your reef environment. Visiting environments like these, I think, is also really important because by just engaging with the natural world, you're again putting value into these systems, and by putting value into these systems you're making them more worthy of conservation effort. And so all of these things that you can do, which are both really enjoyable for you, but also are taking very direct action to try and help the environment around us, including our race. And it's something to not shy away from, you know, not don't feel shame and don't shut off because of it, but rather feel empowered and feel privileged and feel pride in taking care of the environment around us. I think that's that's going to be really key to seeing large scale change. Oh, those were so fantastic. And I couldn't agree more. Like the doomsday thing, it's like, well, the, I mean, everything's already gone to shit. The world's already gone to shit. The climate change has already happened. Like our reefs are mm -hmm. already dead. Like, why do I need to change if this doomsday talk keeps happening? There is no, what's the motivation? I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. I even feel down and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm trying to change the narrative myself and I'm also trying to do these things. And sometimes even I get just so down about this stuff. And I mean, all the headlines Absolutely. don't help, which is another reason why I really wanted you to come on because there is no good 
media anymore about our coral reefs. And I understand that the situation is really bad, which is why I didn't want you to um, filter it in any way. Like, I was like, this is what's going on. This is what the data and the science says. But mm -hmm. we're, there are amazing scientists like you that are doing the work to try to figure it out. And then all of our lobbyists and our NGOs and everyone else that are trying to work with governments to change and get mm -hmm. policy change. And that's also been a theme recently, which I think is so interesting is so many guests that I've had on, they're like, just get involved with your local governments, get involved, mm -hmm. be a voice. Cause you are the people you have a voice, like help pressure our governments to change things, to get different regulations, to start investing in alternative fuel sources, you know, whatever that might be, whatever the next, mm -hmm solution is and there's some you know air uh, well wind there's like wind and solar and hydro and nuclear and like there's so many things that are being worked on and experimented and none of them you know have fossil fuels and so just things like that and so I just love that this mm -hmm. is like there's these themes that just go across mm -hmm. these seemingly completely different topics like river dolphins in the Amazon and <laughs> you're studying coral reefs in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia and yet the solutions are the same which I think mm -hmm. is amazing is amazing and I just hope that everyone listening feels empowered because if you mm -hmm. just do one action how many positive things will ripple from that? And yeah, exactly. Right, right. Like and it's a the snowball. Right? You you take a little you take a little step in your life, and you realize how easy step by step your lifestyle can form into something that is really beneficial for the environment, and the community around you, and you are this wonderful droplet amongst an ocean, you know, of change that that can happen. It's just about it's just about that that healthy communication and working together to try and create large scale change. Because when we've got a problem as big as climate change, it's the only way that we're gonna get change to happen is amongst all of us and to be able to create large enough differences. Yes, and just putting that on like billboards and everything. <laughs> because most of the you know social media that I love to put out there and just as this brand is more of those type of messages. And I always find it really interesting, the pessimistic, responses that I get in return. And I really wish that those people understood the possible damage that they are causing by continuing that narrative. It's like mm -hmm. by intentionally, it's not, there's a difference between being ignorant and naive and just mm -hmm. trying to change the way that we look at this. And there was like a really recent one where it was like, humans are awful. We were, we're killing everything. Why pretty much why, essentially, why are you posting that? And it's just like, mm -hmm. I hope that one day that those people and the people that have commented in that way will see the actual intention and the power of a narrative and stories mm -hmm. and how, just mm -hmm. like you said, one action can lead to another that can lead to another that can lead to another. Like, I think I even like put it in a quote or recently on one of my posts, like action begets action. Like you yeah. have to start somewhere yeah. and then 100%. eventually someone might be feel so inspired that they do finally make that big commitment to go to a government meeting of some sort, to put their voice out, to be like, I am, mm -hmm. I'm making a stance for climate change. And mm -hmm. especially yeah. for something that as is as abstract and as impactful as climate change, like finding a way to have a voice in that. And then at the same time, helping our reefs and pretty much every single other ecosystem. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing too, is like it doesn't matter which which natural wonder you identify with and you feel passionately and drawn to, you can take actions to protect that. And those actions protect multiple systems. And exactly the way you say it's all connected. We're part of this, of course we have our smaller ecosystem, but we're part of such a bigger set of ecosystems and everything is so interconnected. And that, that gives us power because it means that our actions can have such a broad, broad effect. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, um, I love to ask this question towards the end of my interviews, because I, I just never know what anybody's going to say. And I love it. So to anybody listening with your story, I mean, you've had ups and downs, you've had struggles, you've made left turns and right turns and all kinds of stuff. What piece of advice would you like to give to anybody listening? Mm -hmm. Um, I think follow your passion. That's the biggest one for me. 
um, find something that brings you joy and go for it. Because I think on a, a deeper level as well, like we talk about action and t making change and it's so important, but to feel in a position where you can make change, I think you need to have the energy to do that. And to have the energy, it means you need to be happy and joyful. And so it's about finding whatever it is in life that makes you feel good about yourself, about your community and about your world around you. And it doesn't have to be just with your work. It could be what you do in your day to day and the way that you interact with the person on the train across from you. Anything that brings you joy, do it because the world can seem so grim and that Defeat, that gives us this defeatist kind of attitude. But if we have, if we consciously choose in activities and interactions that make us joyful, that gives us the energy and makes us feel empowered enough to have a positive impact on the world around us. And so I think that would be my advice is just keep doing things that make you happy and make you feel positive about who you are as a person and the person and it gives you step as, steps closer to the person that you want to be. Oh, that's so good advice. <laughs> I'm the exact same way. Follow your passions because there's some days it is literally only passion that'll get you through. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah exactly. <laughs> some exactly. days I'm just like, where's my wine? I need a glass of wine now. <laughs> like some yeah. glass of wine now, but then wake up and yeah. get all over again the next day. So uh, only passion is going to keep that going. <laughs> Yeah, 100%, 100%. <laughs> Oh, wonderful, Annie. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you or maybe read more about your work, and I know you're going to be graduating here pretty soon with your PhD, which is so <laughs> exciting. So Next yeah. week. Oh, my God, it's <laughs> next week. Oh, yeah. we will have to have a glass of wine, girl. Well, I will have either a mimosa or you'll have a mimosa. <laughs> yeah. It is very early for you, and it is, uh, yeah, the sun is setting for me. <laughs> Yes, or maybe you like Bloody Marys more, I don't know. But either way, we find a way to <laughs> celebrate in some way, shape, or form. But yes, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or maybe learn more about coral reefs or maybe some resources that you'd love to throw out there, any of that, where mm -hmm. can someone go to learn more about you, your work, and coral reefs? Yeah, I can definitely give you give me my details. Happy for an email if someone's really interested in like that academic side I want to know more about reefs um, but I can also give my Instagram handle as well it's an easy way to get in, get in touch with me as well awesome awesome yeah and yeah just send those to me I'll put them in the show notes for everybody that way um everyone can just check those out at reballology.com but thanks again Great. Annie for sitting down with me on your early morning I cannot wait to share coral reefs with everybody yeah uh, thank you so much for yeah for giving me the opportunity it's been so nice talking to you and nerding out with you <laughs> <laughs> about all things beautiful and biological it's yeah it's a pretty wonderful world hey oh great that was wonderful hey thanks again for listening to this episode of rewildology if you like what you heard hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode do you have a cool environmental organization travel story or research that you'd like to share let me know at rewildology.com until next time friends together we will rewild the planet <laughs>